Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Marion Fourcade, and I am a Director of Social Science Matrix. Uh, I want to thank everybody, both online and in person, for who is joining us today. And uh, this is quite, you know, this is an event that started with a, a little dream that Margaret and I had of, you know, fostering a conversation around organizing. Uh, and, uh, you know, two years down the road, I mean, I think after that, four years after that <laughs> conversation, you know, we finally put it together. And it is a real, real uh, pleasure because I think we have a, a remarkable uh, group of scholars and activists and, you know, people who are thinking about political mobilization and political strategy and um, the conditions of uh, success in uh, political organizing. So this is an event that is part of our Matrix on Point series. Uh, it's a series uh, uh, promoting focused cross-disciplinary conversations on today's most pressing issues. And I want to mention that today's panel is co-sponsored by the Center on Democracy and Organizing, directed uh, by our very own today, Lisa Garcia Bedoya. So, uh, let me just uh, give you a preview of some of the events, uh, this, uh, the, the remaining events this semester. Semester is not very, uh, you know, it's almost at the end. Um, so on May uh, 10th, we will have another Matrix on Point panel uh, marking the approaching and very grim milestone of one million COVID deaths in the United States. Uh, so we have uh, people who from Berkeley talking about the psychological toll about the pandemic um and who will address the question of inequalities in the face of uh you know facing uh, COVID-19. On May 12th uh we will be also hosting a panel on floods and equity together with Global Metropolitan Studies and the UC Berkeley River Lab. So there's many more there's also a lot more of our past events that you can find on Matrix website so I encourage you to browse uh, and also sign up for our newsletter. Now, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our moderator. Uh, Professor Lisa Garcia Bedoya is Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Dean of the Graduate Division and a professor in the Graduate School of Education at Berkeley. She uses the tools of social science to reveal the causes of political and educational inequalities in the United States. She has published six books and dozens of research articles, earning five national book awards and numerous other awards. She has consulted for presidential campaigns and statewide ballot efforts and has partnered with over a dozen community organizations working to empower low-income communities of color. Through those partnerships, she has developed a set of best practices for engaging and mobilizing voters in these communities, becoming one of the nation's foremost experts on political engagements within communities of color. So we couldn't have a better moderator, and I will let Lisa introduce uh, the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marion. And it's a pleasure to be here and, and deeply humbling to be in the presence of such an incredible group of people, all of whom, both in person and online, who are working in different ways to try to build a better world through collective action and organizing. And I'm excited to, as I'm sure all of you are, to learn from them. So I'm going to start by introducing our panelists in the order that they will speak and then um, let them share their wisdom in that order. So starting on my left, um, Margaret Levy is the Sarah Miller McCune Director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, a professor of political science and senior fellow of the Woods Institute at that small university down the road, which name we do not name. Um, <laughs> professor Le <clears throat> sorry, Levy is the author or co-author of numerous articles and six books, including Of Rule and Revenue, Consent, Dissent, and Patriotism, Analytic Narratives, and Cooperation Without Trust. One of her most recent books, In the Interest of Others, explores how organizations provoke member willingness to act beyond material interest. In other works, she investigates the conditions under which people come to believe their governments are legitimate and the consequences of those beliefs for compliance, consent, and the rule of law. Her research continues to focus on how to improve the quality of government and how to generate a better political economic framework. Arisha Hatch is the Vice President and Chief of Campaigns at Color of Change, leading campaigns on civic engagement, voting rights, criminal justice, and corporate and media accountability. 
Arisha is a leader in the racial justice movement. That's kind of an understatement, but a significant leader in the racial justice movement. She organized Black People's Brunches, bringing together more than 12,500 civic-minded Black people in 2018 to discuss a host of social justice issues. Since joining Color of Change in 2012, she has championed getting payment processors like MasterCard and PayPal to ban the use of their platforms by white supremacists persuaded Saturday Night Live to add two black women to its cast and writer's room, and led efforts to remove Donald Trump from Facebook and Twitter. Her editorial writing has been published by Essence, The Root, The Grio, and TechCrunch, and she is a regular commentator on political and social justice topics for major news outlets. We have two uh, panelists who are joining us virtually, Liz McKenna and Michelle Oyakawa. Liz McKenna is a postdoctoral scholar at the SNF Agora Institute and P3 Lab at Johns Hopkins University. Liz studies left and right wing social movements in the United States and Brazil, using multiple methods to examine when civil society organizations safeguard against authoritarianism and when they become the primary carriers of it. She's the co-author of Groundbreakers, How Obama's 2.2 Million Volunteers Transformed Campaigning in America with Hari Han and Prisms of the People, Power and Organizing in 21st Century America with Hari Han and Michelle Oyakawa. Liz received the 2021 American Sociological Association Best Dissertation Award for her dissertation on politics and organizing in contemporary Brazil. Michelle Oyakawa is an assistant professor of sociology at Muskegon University in Ohio. She studies the intersection of race, religion, and social movements through her research on leaders and organizations. Her work has been published in academic journals, including Qualitative Sociology, Sociology of Religion, and the Journal of Community Psychology. And she is co-author of two books about mobilization, Prisons of the People and Smart Suits, Tattered Boots, Black Ministers, and Mobilization in the 21st Century with Corey Edwards. Some of you may know that Hari Han was supposed to be with us today. Unfortunately, her daughter had a soccer accident and blew out her SEL. And so she uh, is not able to join us. And let's have a good positive thought for teenage healing um, after soccer injury. And last but not least is Marshall Gans, um, the Rita E. Hauser Senior Lecturer in Leadership Organizing and Civil Society at the Kennedy School of Government. He teaches, researches, and writes on leadership, narrative, strategy, and organization and social movements, civic associations, and politics. He has published in the American Journal of Sociology, American Political Science Review, American Prospect, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and elsewhere. His newest book, Why David Sometimes Wins, Leadership, Organization, and Strategy in the California Farm Worker Movement, earned the Michael J. Harrington Book Award of the American Political Science Association. In 2007-8, he was instrumental in designing the grassroots organization for the 2008 Obama for President campaign. In association with the Global Leading Change Network, he coaches, trains, and advises social, civic, educational, healthcare, and political groups on organizing, training, and leadership development around the world. So just want to remind you that if you have questions for our panelists, please put them into the Q&A function, and we'll go to them after they give their opening remarks. And I will turn it over to Professor Reed. Thank you, Lisa. And great to see you again and be up here with you. Yes. Um, so last Friday night I had dinner with Michael Lipsky, who I um, this was who I first met in 1969 when I was a graduate student at Harvard and he'd come to MIT to to teach. And the year before that, in 1968, <laughs> um, I had used some of his work, protest as a political resource, in order to help um, a group called the South End Tenants Council, a low income black group that was fighting urban renewal as well as fighting rent lords, um, in organizing a successful rent strike. So I got to meet Michael, Michael I got to take his class, and um, as a result of our now multi year friendship, but in those early years in 1970, we published a paper based on the South End Tenants Council experience called community organizing as a political resource. So I'm telling you all this to tell you how long I've been thinking about these questions. <laughs> I actually started before that because I was part of ERAP, in which it was part of uh, SDS. So what that means is Economic Rights and Action Project of the Students for a Democratic Society, which I did in um, high school. So I've been thinking about how do you organize low income people for a very long time but have had none of the kinds of success that some of the other people sitting at this table have had, I have to say. 
so I met with Michael again last Friday night um, for dinner after I had returned. I was in DC. I was on my way back from a meeting in Virginia of a group called Reimagining America. Um, I was telling Marshall about this. I was probably the oldest person in the room, but I was also, I have to say, one of the few academics. Uh, most of the people there were from progressive think tanks, but even more of them were from grassroots community organizations, really trying hard to figure out how to not just reimagine America, but remake America by listening to the people on the ground and trying to figure out organizing strategies based on what people wanted rather than just going to them and telling them what they should want or who they should vote for or what they should do. It was very inspiring. And some of those organizations were exactly the organizations like Lucha and others um, that Hari and um, Michelle and Liz have written about. So, you know, I've spent a large part, not my, not everything I do, but a large part of my life being an academic, thinking about how do you analyze these kinds of organizations and what makes for their success and why do they sometimes fail? Why do they sometimes succeed? Um, and really trying to think about the kind of power that people can build um, that it would be the basis of real democratic practice and change. So today I sit on a panel with a host of people whose intellectual and political work I just so strongly admire. And all are part of this same tradition and have really carried it on much, much more than I have of trying to enable people not only to express, but to also act on their grievances and in the process make our democracy far more democratic. All of us obviously have assumptions about how individual actions and motivations aggregate. But more importantly, I think, all of the people on this panel, sitting on this stage and on the Zoom stage, think about how organizations, not just the individuals come together, but how organizations facilitate that collective action and how they structure um, interactions and evoke collective action and protest. So my take obviously is from the perspective of an academic who studies the problem rather than a strategic activist who makes things happen, though I applaud all those who do make things happen and I'm a little jealous of them. Um, and like some of the other panelists, I've, I've looked at various cases and abstracted and then tried to figure out how my findings or our findings in some cases might apply in other contexts and might be able to be scaled. The, the work that was mentioned in the interest of others um, looks at unions in the transport sector in the United States and in Australia. So basically Teamsters and longshore workers and mostly longshore workers, um, those who work on the docks. And we this was a, a work I did with John Alquist, who was at the time one of my graduate students is now a full professor at UCSD. And we were interested in this not only because of our interest in unions, I was at that time the Harry Bridges Chair in Labor Studies, who was a legendary leader of uh, the longshore workers. But we were interested in unions as unions, but also because they really are mini democracies. And if you think about unions and the multitude of unions in the United States when they existed, and even those that still exist, um, you can see that they take very different forms of democracy. Some are really very top-down democracies with very little role for the membership, what gets called business unions, where basically you pay dues, you vote on some things, like the president, often through some process that, that keeps you some distance from the actual direct vote. Um, you vote on the bargaining contract, but mostly you pay the leadership to represent you. It's not really an active democratic process. Other unions at the other extreme and two of the unions we studied, one in the US, the International Longshore Workers Union, and one in the um, Warehouse Workers Union, and one in Australia, the Maritime Union of Australia, um, were actual real democracies. And we thought that might make a difference because one of the things that we noticed about those unions and part of what motivated the study were, were these were unions that were able to evoke from their members costly actions 
costly actions in the sense that it could lose them their jobs, it could get them put in jail, it could get them physically harmed, um, it could affect family well-being once they were able to afford families. Um, and yet they engaged in these costly actions on behalf of others. They closed the docks and did other things, refused to load certain things on ships, on behalf of far distant others who were strangers and who were not in a position to reciprocate. They may never meet them. They may never get anything back from them. They weren't other unions who might then support them you know, down the line on a strike. So it was a very puzzling, particularly for someone like me who had also been toying and using rational choice theory, how this could happen. This went, was way beyond um, self-interest, right? These were not people only acting in their narrow economic self-interest. So what did we discover? What did John and I discover were the conditions that enabled that to happen, which I think is getting people to act or finding a way for people to discover in themselves ways to act in the interest of others is a very crucial piece of how we create organizations that can actually be serious change agents um, because they're thinking not just about their own private interests, but they're thinking about a larger society. And we came up with effectively two essential conditions. I'm gonna break one of them down a little bit, but the first one was were that in all these cases, these two cases and others that we looked at that had some of the same characteristics, the union leadership and the union were very successful in delivering what union members have a right to expect, improvements in their wages, hours, working conditions, um, benefits. So they got the economic benefits, they got those as well. But then there were a series of government arrangements that turned out, and they were democratic government governance arrangements that turned out to be incredibly critical for enabling people to see that their interests were tied up with the interest of others who could never reciprocate, that they could act in the interest of others. And in doing so, in some ways, they were acting in their own interest, but not, not in a narrow way, but because if it could happen to them, it could happen to us. Um, that kind of thinking was what really got promoted. And the governance arrangements that were critical here were participatory democracy. I've already, you know, that they really did directly vote on, on contracts, on leadership. They had discussions, all kinds of things. Um, accountable leaders. They were able to hold their leadership's feet to the fire. Not, they could easily recall leaders. It just took 15 people to create a recall for a national leader. That didn't mean the leader would be recalled, but it was very easy to, to start that process. They had a whole variety of other ways of holding leaders accountable. They engaged in socialization processes that were about the world, really ensuring that the membership had some sense of what was going on around them, not just in their own neighborhoods and in their own uh, private circumstances. And finally, and I think this is really important as I think about what the world is like today, they encourage deliberation, discussion, debate, challenge before making a collective decision whether or not to engage in a particular action. Let me make that concrete. Um, a, a group of longshore workers, pensioners that we were interviewing in Australia, we were asking them, some of them had been involved in refusing to load armaments onto Dutch ships going to Indonesia to put down the peasant rebellion, not in their particular mm. economic interest. Um, and there are lots of cases like that. Those are the kinds of cases that we were studying. So some of the, they were, they were having a lunchtime meeting and some of the leadership came and said, see those ships, they're, they're, going, to, in, they're going to Indonesia, they're Dutch ships. And then there was a conversation and people said, should I believe the leader? What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? And they, com they combined their information until they became convinced that was in fact a fact, that was in fact the story. And then they all said, that's not fair dinkum. They said, so we're not gonna load those guns. And so they boycotted the, what they called the Black Arma Armada for several years, just refused <coughs> to send armaments or or other things that would help the Dutch soldiers put down the Indonesian rebellion. Okay, so those two essential conditions, 
creating some economic benefits, providing for people's welfare so that they can think outside their immediate needs, and then creating a culture and a set of practices that encouraged thinking about others. The result is what we call an expanded community of fate, not faith, fate, in which you feel like your fate is entwined with that of others. So this was a proof of possibility. It was actually possible. So in my last minute, let me raise some concerns about the model that I've just put out there. First of all, it could go the other way. Any community of fate could be used for bad purposes as well as good, even expanded. We were looking at progressive unions, but Nazism is a community of fate, not exactly progressive, clearly racist. The corrective here, what made this inclusive and expanded was democratic practices that were also inclusive of the racially diverse union. And then the other big problem, and I will end here, Lisa, is how to scale this. So one way is federated to create federated organizations. Another is a common cause. War often does this, COVID did not. The international youth movement around climate change has become intergenerational. That might be an example and a model to think about. But ultimately, I would argue we need change in the national governance structures, building a moral political economy, something I've been working on, um, that is truly democratic and that facilitates this kind of process much more broadly. Thank, thank you. you. Perfectly on time. Oh, good. Um, thank you so much. I'm sitting next to her, so she's really signaling. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Arisha. Uh, I am the daughter of Ollie, um, who was a retired salesman, um, and Patricia, who was a retired elementary school teacher. Uh, they met in college in Texas. I'm a Texan. Um, it's always surprising to me to um, come to schools and meet professors. Um, who study this sort of work um, because it certainly wasn't what I was studying when I was in college. Um, I didn't grow up with a radical black politic. Um, my parents were regular voters, but um, uh, wouldn't have considered themselves um, like terribly politically engaged. I grew up always um, knowing or being told that I was supposed to be a lawyer perhaps because my grandmother wasn't allowed to be or because my father couldn't afford to be, um, probably because I was like an argumentative little girl. And I think that that's what they just like tell little girls that argue like, oh, you should be a lawyer. Um, and so it just became very much ingrained in my head that that was what I was supposed to do. And so um, I went to undergrad, um, at Stanford, the school, well, I'll name the school, and then went straight through the law <laughs> I school. I did too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, uh, was finishing up law school at the end of 2007 and, and found myself called to go volunteer for the Obama campaign for the first time. I was like really excited and was making phone calls from my apartment um, in Oakland at the time. And um, on their website, I was making calls that like, I can go you know, debate with people about why they should vote for their first black president. Um, and was spending my summer do doing that as I waited for my bar results. Um, and then at some point, a little window popped up and said, hey, do you want to go into an office and make phone calls? And I was like, I didn't even know they had offices. I didn't grow up in places. Um, and I've learned since then that there's a reason why um, a Black girl um, with Democratic parents, um, oftentimes in places like Texas or conservative parts um, of, of California, there weren't political offices engaging me or my family about the importance of civic participation. Um, there weren't people calling our houses or knocking on our doors telling us to come out and vote. Um, uh, uh, and so when I stumbled into the Obama office in Berkeley um, more than 10 years ago, I mean, 15 years ago almost, um, I was just, everything felt new to me. Um, and I spent the summer I, I, um, making phone calls. I closed down the office the first day making phone calls. And they said, can you come back tomorrow? And I said, sure, I have nothing to do. 
came back the next day, closed down the office making phone calls. Um, and I didn't know it then because I didn't, I wasn't a community organizer, didn't realize people like did this for a living, studied it for a living. Um, but I was like the perfect volunteer. I had like no job. I had all of this time. Um, and I was just like willing to do whatever. Um, and so someone sat me down, asked me out for, you know, coffee the next day. Um, I learned later they were having a one-to-one -one with me, you know, <laughs> told me their story, asked me about my story. You know, there was a specific urgent ask. Um, and they asked me if I'd be a part of the super team that would lead the office. And I was like, sure, I'll be a part of the super team. And then they asked me to go to this training called Camp Obama. Actually, they didn't even say it was a training. They said, they said you're going to Camp Obama. <laughs> and I like spent the whole night being like, what could Camp Obama mean? <laughs> um, and was taken off to Sacramento to go to this training and sit in these sorts of, sorts of groups. Um, and I, through that, through that campaign, through that training, being forced to tell my story of self in front of so many people, I fell in love with community organizing. I actually couldn't imagine going back to being like a corporate lawyer um, and uh, found myself just sort of fell down um, the rabbit hole of this work. Um, years later, um, um, my you know parents were deeply upset that I didn't go back to the law firm, but um, they can thank Marshall and so many others <laughs> um, for that. Um, I found myself in 2012 headed to an organization called Color of Change um, that at the time I hadn't heard of. Um, and I sort of came in super naive, like, hey, will anything racist happen? Um, and several weeks later, Trayvon Martin was killed. And so my, um, I think, perspective is um, one, as a, a, a a person that's been doing black racial justice organizing um, from like Trayvon until now, um, which I think is a an interesting time period in some ways a privilege, but also deeply traumatic time period um, to be um, trying to build power um, with and on behalf of black people. Um, while so many have done this work um, invisibly, I had this, like, I, I think, privileged opportunity um, to do this work um, when more people were discussing and when more of the, the harms that my community faces were visible. Um, I think my perspective is also a person that arrived at an organization with five people and $500,000 a year um, and um, a few hundred thousand members on an email list. Um, to now an organization that um, has reached to tens or 15 million people um, who are taking action uh, regularly, um, hopefully strategic action to win change for Black people, and a staff of 150 to 200 people, um, and a, a, a much larger budget. Um, and so I guess I also have, in the last 10 years, gained a perspective about um, what it means to build an organization that maybe we now hope one day will be an in institution that we like leave beyond ourselves um, and what it means to try to do that uh, build a black led institution inside of a, um, a, a, a political environment in which um, there's a lot of distrust and cynicism about institutions in which we're watching, you know, declining and decaying institutions. Um, uh, for those that don't know, Color of Change was founded as sort of a digital first organization um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And for years, we believed ourselves um, to just have members who only want to take action online. They, they would, um, we would send them an email and they would click on a petition um, and we have a, send a target letter to the, the corporation or political um, elected official that we were targeting. Um, and uh, uh, that would be the negotiation. Um, but uh, in 2016, we began to sort of explore uh, what it would look like to have offline events. Um, we started to host textathons, not quite phone banks, but textathons, um, uh, encouraging people to turn out to vote. And what we saw very quickly was that hundreds of people would come out to any event. And as someone who was a community organizer and who 
you know, had gone to events where only five people showed up, um, we, I understood and we understood very quickly, like, how exciting this is, what potential there is now that we have a million people on our list at this point, or two million people on our list to really try to move action to scale. And so we've been doing that sort of, um, we um, invested in doing more offline organizing work, um, and, and really focused on building community um, building a sense of belonging um, and uh, uh, building a big tent uh, where uh, Black folks and our allies can come into space with each other, build community with one another, um, gain political education with one another, and then take strategic action together. Um, and so we have um, tens of thousands of people, neighborhood teams across the country uh, that most of which started with the Black Women's Brunch, um, who are building together, who have uh, elected dozens and dozens of progressive district attorneys across the country, and who are finding new ways to compete for power at the local level. And I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, four minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're now going to turn online, and I'm really hoping our Technological Magic Works uh, for, with Liz and Michelle. Okay, we're all good. I, I have a direct message, so I'm hoping that I'm not speaking into the abyss right now, but thank you so much. Um, I didn't know the origin story of this panel, Mahion and, and Margaret, so thank you for having the vision for it. And to Lisa and my esteemed co-panelists and all the Matrix organizers. Um, so it's great to be back in Berkeley, although I'm actually zooming in from a rural town in Brazil where I'm doing research on some of the organizing happening in advance of this fall's presidential election here. And a little word of caveat about my internet, it's about nine o'clock here and a tropical storm just blew in. So I'm gonna do my best to channel a good organizer and be strategic and adaptive if, if the Wi-Fi gods don't cooperate. But I wanted to start um, with a quick personal reflection about the topic of the panel today and tell you, um, and then turn to the book that um, my amazing collaborators, Hari Han, who sends her regrets, and Michelle Oyakawa and I wrote about some of the bright spots of progressive organizing in the United States. So when I was a college undergraduate, I was way less critical and insightful about the world than many of the undergrads I taught while I was a GSI at Berkeley. In that, I was completely swept up in and uncritical of methods of social change that had nothing to do with the kind of organizing that Margaret and Arisha just talked about. And then just before I was going to come to Brazil for the first time to write what I thought was going to be a a totally laudatory undergraduate thesis about microfinance and how individualistic social enterprise style social change efforts were, quote, the antidote to poverty. I did one of those things that, of course, when you look back on it, you can point to it in your life as being an inflection point, um, but you don't know it at the time. And that was enroll in Marshall Ganz's organizing class. So I will never forget the look of I guess I would call it peevish skepticism when I waxed poetic about social enterprise in Marshall's class. And the lens and that experience, that the experience that gave me sort of the vocabulary and a framework that I lacked to understand that not all forms of social activism are alike and they often work at cross purposes. Um, this is something Michelle and I will talk about. So, so fast forward, um, I graduated from college in June of 2008 and the world was melting down, global financial crisis. And that's you know, when it finally clicked for me that what actually was, was when actually engaged with the practice of organizing first um, with the Obama campaign also um, in 2008 in rural Ohio, and then working as an organizer with economic solidarity cooperatives in Brazil. And what clicked for me about what was different about organizing from all other forms of social activism was that organizing is fundamentally about power. So it might sound like I'm stating the obvious, but when I talk to people in the nonprofit world, the foundation world, advocacy in general, um, I sense that when we hear or when people use words like community organizing, they're thinking of something kind of fluffy, like, oh yeah, that's nice community engagement, letter writing, door knocking around election time, maybe the odd protest here and there. Um, and to be perfectly honest, 
I don't think that's an entirely unfair association because I think many organizations and foundations in the US have totally co-opted the vocabulary of organizing and what they're doing is actually saying very different, often rapid response mobilization at best or acting as vendors for voter turnout to national party committees and so forth. And I wanna be really clear that I think the dilution of this term or the co-optation of, of the organizing language um, is different from what Ed Walker talks about in his book, Grassroots for Hire, or Alex Hertel Fernandez and his work on astroturfing and the right, specifically with Americans for Prosperity, where basically in those cases, corporations and consultants are affecting, effectively faking a base um, out of nothing. What I'm talking about is something different, which is long, long standing, often service providing, mostly apolitical because they have to be because of their nonprofit 501c3 status, um, political campaigns, flash in the pan mobilization efforts that say they're doing organizing work. Um, in fact, the, the current buzzword among politicos in the Democratic Party right now is, quote, relational organizing, which I find to be sort of a redundant term because I'm not sure what kind of organizing is not relational. Um, but but this is about this this point that I'm trying to make is about what I confused um, when I was an undergraduate in college, civic engagement or well-meaning meaning activism or protest participation as power building. Um, and in my research and my work on organizing and organization, what really motivates me is to understand where actual measurable power building is happening. Um, and where do we see groups building what I think um, it was Eric Olin Wright who first coined the term associational power? And what are they doing that helps explain their success? success? So that question took me to some pretty wonderful and some pretty weird places. Um, and of course, it's happening really well on the right in a lot of places. I think, Margaret, you alluded to this. Um, it's happening in NRA gun clubs. Um, Ziad Munson's book on the pro-life movement tells us a lot about the associational power of that movement and how we got to the news that we received this week about the Supreme Court and Roe v. Wade. It's happening in evang evangelical churches and it's happening where I am right now in Brazil where I'm following some pretty terrifyingly effective right-wing and neo-fascist organizing and base building. But I'm not here to talk about that research. I'm here to talk about much more um, hopeful um, research um, that uh, about the book that Hari and Michelle and I just completed. Um, and that is our recently published book called Prisons of the People. So I'm gonna pull that up and do a very quick um, overview of the book. And then turn over to Michelle. Um, so Prisms of the People, Power and Organizing in 21st Century America. Um, and here's the very groovy color if you, cover if you'd like to add it to your, to your bookshelf. Um, but what we do in this, in this project and what really motivated it was to study outlier cases of organizing organizations. So the, not the kind that I was talking about earlier, not the astroturfing, not the exclusionary right-wing organizing groups not the kind of civic engagement, apolitical groups, but ones that were, were really building a con constituency base and wielding it for power. Um, and we know lots and lots of research says that actually the, the null expectation, the most likely expectation is the status quo. Power is so tipped, so asymmetrical that most efforts fail um, to produce any change whatsoever. So what we wanted to do was develop a study that looked at not you know the many organizations that fall into this upper left-hand quadrant, which is, they have few resources, traditional or non-traditional resources, money, people, access, um, and then they wield very little power. And not organizations like the NRA, this is a cover of Matt Lacombe's recent book um, about the NRA, where they have a really extraordinary amount of resources, um, access to the highest level government officials, tons of people, tons of money, tons of media, um, clout and so forth, and are, are wielding a, a great deal of political power. But much more analytically interesting and strategically interesting for a lot of the groups we work with and are invested in is those kind of off diagonal boxes. So where are groups that have traditionally or at first glance, low levels of resources, um, but they're actually punching above their weight, exercising um, a lot of power. And so the two kind of seminal studies that we point to in our book are um, Liz Clemens' work, um, The People's Lobby, where she discusses, for example, the women's movement, which, you know, a group, a constituency that didn't even have the right to vote, and yet were able to wield significant political power. And then, of course, Marshall's work um, and the farm workers and how it was that this 
under seemingly under resourced union was able to beat it, beat out um, the 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 big Goliath, um, the union that had all on paper all of the resources. And then, uh, of course, there's work like Theta Scotch, Theta Scotch Bowls on the environmental environmental movement, which has tons of celebrity star power, lots of money, very good public opinion polling, and yet is has barely been able to move the needle on a lot of the questions that, that matter to them. So we were interested in these, the upper right hand corner here, um, contemporary movement cases. I'm going to tell you one case um, very quickly and then turn it over to Michelle um, to talk. mentioned, I think it was Lisa and Margaret mentioned actually our, our work with Lucha. So one of our cases um, was Arizona. And we started with the passage of SB 1070, which was one of the most restrictive anti-immigrant bills to pass in the country written, written by ALEC, um, the American Legislative Exchange Council. And um, there was there was massive civil resistance in response, a 104 day protest on the Capitol lawn, high school students walked out, prayer circles were formed. This was Arizona in the summer, you know, 110 degree heat and hundreds of people um, stayed on the Capitol lawn, but the bill still passed. Um, it was the kind of, it was a watershed moment in terms of uh, the right wing taking over state level legislators. And yet, um, here's one quote from one of our interviewees who talks a little bit about sort of the, the pre SB 1070 moment. So he said, the first thing to note was that there was relatively non-existent resistance to SB 1070 before the bill was signed. There was no even ACLU, there was no Mexican Legal Defense Fund. There was just frankly speaking, there was a lack of civil society. There was a lack of, you know, almost non-existent civil rights, a non non-existent civil rights bar in Phoenix, you know? I mean, like you say, who are the civil rights lawyers in Phoenix and Arizona? There were none. At the time, Phoenix was like the fourth largest city in America, but it was one that sort of grew up so fast and without all of these institutions and cultural practices that you expect in other places, and which contributed to this overall kind of dystopian environment that occurred leading up to SB 1070. So fast forward 10 years, we all know the story, a Republican stronghold, Arizona flipped blue. And what we document in the book is the work of Lucha to do things like pass the minimum wage, elect a progressive majority on the city council, um, sort of they narrow the gap significantly in terms of the democratic representation at the state level. And then um, by coding legislation over the past 15 years in, in the state, we showed that the number of anti-immigrant bills dropped by half, even as they were able to recall the author of SB 1070 itself, Russell Pierce. And so here is um, a screenshot of an article. You can read to the two leaders of Lucha, Alex Gomez and Tomas Robles wrote about this in the New York Times. So you can, you can take it from them, um, sort of the story of that transformation and the power shift that we document in the book. Um, okay, so what's the analytical leverage? What's the so what? How do they do it? I'm going to tell you very briefly what our methodological approach was, and then Michelle's going to um, wrap this up with, uh, with the findings. But what we did was we took this approach called a most different case selection strategy. And the reason we did that is because a lot of people, and if you read the coverage of Arizona and how to, is Arizona turned blue, um, it focuses on the narrative of demographic change, sort of this um, exogenous fact, which is that these states, there are certain states, Georgia, Arizona, and others, and the demographics are changing. And with the demographics changing, uh, the, Democrat, the Dem Democrats will come to power. And so what we did is we said, okay, well, let's vary all of the things that we know in the literature, help predict movement success, like the political landscape, you know, whether or not they're Democrats in power or not. We didn't want to only choose a bunch of Berkeley Californias. Um, we wanted to look at places like Arizona, Minnesota, Ohio, Virginia, which ended up bringing our four core cases where politics were much more mixed. Um, we looked at population growth, economic conditions, the density of civic organizations, the union density and the membership rates over time. And so the, this kind of slide just demonstrates that what we were looking for was if we could set aside all of those factors that we um, that are known to predict movement success, what could we find, what if anything could we find in these six cases in terms of their movement, um, in terms of the movement outcomes. I'll turn the mic over to Michelle and look forward to engaging more later. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you to all the other panelists and the hosts for having me. Um, 
Real quick background, I, I learned about community organizing through my college roommate. Uh, I ended up working with Isaiah in Minnesota as an organizer. Um, and then I decided to do my dissertation with the Ohio Organizing Collaborative, which is where I met Hari. Um, so what I wanna say and kind of bringing it back around to how Liz started, um, I think it's really important to understand that a major obstacle for all of our case organizations was the entire ecosystem of organizations that they are embedded in. This has been called the nonprofit industrial complex and includes funders, political consultants, uh, academics like us, um, and the whole field of, field of nonprofit social movement organizations. Uh, this nonprofit industrial complex operates according to a set of assumptions that are often directly at odds with what we find allows organizations to build prisons of the people. The common thread is that the dominant model by design uh, locates decision making power with a group of elites that's often detached from the communities that people are organizing in. Right. So for instance, in the dominant model, building power is a matter of activating supporters for a pre-existing agenda designed by experts. To build prisms of the people, on the other hand, requires a different approach that emphasizes building trust and loyalty with a group of people who are regularly taking action together. Uh, next slide, please. Furthermore, in dominant models of collective action, the primary strategy is to gain proximity to decision makers. However, to build power rooted in a constituency base means that power needs to come from an organized base that moves into action instead of from relationships with elites. Final slide. Finally, looking at characteristics of the constituency base, for dominant models of collective action, there is an emphasis on hierarchical relationships that are task-oriented. And what those tasks are is determined by people outside of the base, uh, often from national organizations that are based in far off cities from the people who are organizing on the ground. Uh, our model calls instead for people in communities themselves to be the decision makers uh, and to be the strategists. We call them distributed strategists. Uh, the PRISMS model requires that people in a base be committed to one another rather than to a political candidate or a particular issue. And I think it's really important uh, to recognize and address that how organizations are funded and the expectations that they must adhere to ma to maintain legitimacy within the nonprofit field work against what we believe is important for building prisms of the people, uh, which is rooting power in a constituency base rather than a following of mobilized supporters uh, committed to an agenda designed by elites. Thank you. Last but not least, the thread that seems to be running through all of our presentations today, um, Marshall. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, is this all working? Good. Um, yeah, if you're on the planet long enough, you accumulate a lot of threads. And so that's kind <laughs> of a part of this. But um, uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to have this conversation. Really been looking forward to it. Uh, it's also, for me, uh, almost any excuse to get back to California is good. Uh, in Hebrew, there's two words for where you live. One means where you're sojourning, and the other one means where you reside. And I've been sojourning back at Harvard for a long time, but when I get off the plane here, I know where I reside. It's this state where I spent so much of my life and work. Um, what I want to say just a little bit in terms of, of where I'm coming from, I've I've had the privilege, the real blessing actually, to get introduced to organizing the civil rights movement uh, in 1964 uh, when I dropped out of Harvard to join SNCC. And after that, uh, 16 years with the farm workers out here in California. And after that, 10 years of electoral organizing. And then uh, introduced to the studying of organizing when I went back to school and finished my undergraduate degree, master's and PhD in sociology, which is where we met. Uh, and, and so forth. And what I found, though, was that my place of integration between the social science I was learning and my life experience was teaching. But it wasn't teaching about organizing, it was teaching organizing. There's a big difference teaching about something than teaching the practice of something. And so the development of a pedagogy of practice, I think, has probably been most central to the work that I've been doing where the attempt is to align pedagogy and practice so you don't learn about relationship building by getting a lecture, you build relationships. 
So that's kind of where I'm coming from on this. And so I want to say just a couple of words about what I mean by organizing and also since we're supposed to be talking about democracy, democracy. On organizing, and you know, there's lots of different definitions, but my own perspective is that it's a form of leadership. And it's a form of leadership rooted in three questions for me, uh, articulated by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who uh, when asked, how do I figure out what to do with my life? Said, ask yourself these three questions. The first one, if I am not for, my, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Not selfish, but self-regarding. You know, what calls me? What, what do I expect from this? But the, and, and enough self-awareness, you can actually see others. The second question, though, is if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what, a human being and not a thing, is to recognize we are relational creatures. We exist in relationship with others. Our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably wrapped up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? Uh, not advice to jump into moving traffic, but a caution against what Jane Adams called the snare of preparation. Just know your strategic planning, we'll have the perfect plan, and then we'll go implement, and then the world will totally conform to our expectations, except that never happens. Or um, just another degree, and I will have the answer to all the world's questions. That may not happen either. The point is that rarely can we learn to do well what we want to do until we actually begin to do it. In other words, that understanding flows from action rather than preceding it, and that makes learning a, a critical piece of action uh, as, as we move forward. So the, the other element about leadership is that when it's needed, you know, um, I don't know if you've had experience in your organizations where everything's going really great. People say, where's the leadership so we can thank them? When do people say who's in charge? When? You can answer. Yes. You're unhappy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, see, if you really think about it, when everything is working, what do you need leadership for? The system's working. The adaptive, agentic, creative work of leadership, which social science has a hard time grappling with, that's when things are, they're, they're dilemmas, they're contradictions, they're problems. And so it's kind of, there never will be this time in which everything's gonna be under control. Uh, and that's something to accept because that's a challenge to, well, do I have the skills I'll need? And that's a challenge to the hands. Uh, can I use my resources in new ways? That's a strategic challenge, challenge to the head. And then where do I get the hope? Where do I get the courage? How do I inspire the hope and courage in others that it takes to take real risks that are involved in dealing with real challenges? And that's a challenge to the heart. So the definition of leadership that I use is that it is about accepting responsibility because there's a choice or enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. So this is not a diva view of leadership, uh, quite the opposite. It's about enabling others to achieve shared purpose. Now, organizing for me is a particular form of leadership that begins by asking first, who are my people? Not what's my issue, who are my people? Who, who is the community with whom I am engaging in, in this work that we're doing? Then secondly, what is the change that they need, that they want? What's the lived experience here? What's the hurt points? Where's the hope? Not because I did a survey and I know better what's in their interest, which means engaging with people. And finally, how to work with people so they can translate the resources they do have into the power that they need in order to create the change they want. Uh, so it's not about uh, uh, serving uh, customers. Uh, it's not about selling products to customers. It's not about uh, market, uh, providing services to clients. It's about building constituency. And literally, the word constituency comes from the Latin constare, which means to stand together. It's to bring people together, to stand together, learn together, decide together, act together, and hopefully win together. Now, um, so that's kind of the basic approach that I take to organizing. Now, when it comes to democracy, so it's about people, change, and power, or people, power, and change. Now, democracy is supposed to be a form of collective governance uh, based on each person's equal voice as opposed to the extent of each person's property, status, race, religion, gender, education, or profession. In other words, it's based on the idea that each person has a, the value, has equivalent value, equal voice. Um, now, in terms of thinking of democracy then as a practice, 
see, for me, organizing comes together in this way. If you understand democracy not as something we have, but something that we do, in other words, a form of practice, not a thing, but a way of doing things, then it turns out that's what organizing is really about. That organizing is not about protest, that's a tactic. Organizing is not about lobbying, that could be a tactic. Fundamentally, it is about practicing democracy. It is about bringing people together to exercise shared voice and to work together to accomplish what they're set out to do. And from my perspective, it's rooted in five basic human competencies that we all have, which is building civic relationships. It's about learning how to translate values into the sources of our motivations through storytelling. It's about turning what we have into what we need to get what we want, i.e. power through strategizing. It's about, uh, uh, it's about structuring our work with each other so that we can coordinate, learn, develop leadership. And finally, it's about action. It's about actually changing facts on the ground, whether it's votes in a, in a ballot box, people in a meeting, or whatever it might be. Now, if you think about from this perspective, the crisis in American democracy, which we've been talking about, is that what we're in the midst of, it seems to me, is an acute erosion in the power of civil society to access democratic government via citizenship in the form of equal voice to restrain concentrations of private power via ownership in the form of wealth. In other words, citizenship versus ownership is, 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 our, is, our, is our governing policy based on equal citizenship? Is it based on unequal ownership? Sid Verba, the scholar of, uh, of voting and, and political participation, argued that uh, liberal democracy is really an experiment to see if equality of voice can balance on inequality of resources. And that's sort of the deal. Now, the unique role of civil society in this was, uh, you know, classically articulated by de Tocqueville in the 1830s. And what he was talking about was the power of association. Okay. And he was talking about associations and associations as places where people could join together, learn how to take their individual interests and reconstitute it as shared common interest, develop affective bonds with one another for solidarity and learn how to govern themselves or what he called habits of the heart. So as playing a fundamental kind of role in all this, it's a way to translate, transform individual preferences into collective ones, individual commitments to shared commitments and individual resources into collective power through self-governance. Unfortunately, how am I doing on time? You have six minutes. Oh, okay, good. I'll speed up, okay. Um, unfortunately, for the last 40 to 50 years, the assault on government, with which we're all familiar with, has actually been an assault on democracy itself. It's very important to appreciate that, I think. Eroding the tax base, crippling public policy, diminishing the credibility of a collective anything, and revealing that the real problem in our government is not its capacity to provide services, not an efficiency problem, but rather its failure to offer our people equal representation a problem that gets worse each year. And all this time, we keep coming up with alternatives to democratic government, contract out, social enterprise, so on and so on, rather than actually, or efficiency, rather than think about the representative mechanism itself is radically broken. And, and I say that not because like, oh, that's such a big thing, we can never deal with it, but rather to understand so we can diagnose what we need to do, understanding, now, what am I talking about? Well. First, we have that well-known array of institutional or constitutional problems that go all the way back to the three-fifth rule, where a white voter could, their vote could count one and three-fifths, the three-fifths being the counting of an enslaved person. Right at the very beginning, one vote was not equal to another vote. And that has persisted, and if anything, gotten worse. Um, the um, incumbent design districts that are not competitive, so we don't have that going on. Uh, first by the post districts, in which 51% uh, gets you 100% of the representation, 49% gets you zero, nothing. Talk about what create, creates uh, dichotomous binary things. Of course, the Electoral College, we've all been talking about uh, all these minority presidents that we've had that managed to get us into wars and undermine uh, our democratic practice. And most egregiously, I have to say, 
a Senate that counts the vote of one person in Wyoming 64 times of greater value than that of the vote of any person in this room, anyone in California. And if that weren't bad enough, this filibuster deal frustrates even the, the majority representation, even of such a minority institution. Now, these are real problems, and, and they, they go back to the fact that the, the founders were more interested in being a republic than a democracy. In fact, they feared democracy, and that's why a lot of these institutions are in place. The second challenge, so that's one, second one has been the monetization of our politics. And I point particularly to Buckley v. Vallejo in the 1970s that ruled that money is speech. We talk a lot about the problem of where money comes from. The real problem is where money goes. It's how it's spent. And because there is no bars on, on campaign spending, unlike most liberal democracies that constrain spending in one way or another, it, the demand is infinite. And the result is having created an industry, a multi-billion dollar industry of political advertising. And, and what it's done is to transform what politics is. To the extent politics has ever been about people engaging with other people in deliberative learning, mobilizing practices, it's turned into um, branding. It's turned into the disaggregation of communities into individuals. It's turned into messaging rather than dialogue or conversation. And the fact that industry has been created means that it's in their interest to cost more because the more it costs, the more they make. And so now we get this infinite, the only way we can participate in politics is you gotta give money to this one, give money to this one. I sort of stopped because I just didn't wanna keep fueling the consulting industry. I wanted to try to do something to bring back some sort of uh, control. And finally, and these points have been talked about is civil society itself in which membership-based self-governing associations uh, are replaced by donor-based nonprofit top-down firms that actually extend the power of wealth even more, even more by colonizing civil society through their 501c3s, their foundations, their high net worth individuals that actually um, claim the right to be heard. Okay, so what do we do about it? I'm reminded, oh, can I have one more minute? I gotta tell of this one story. All right. Um, uh, I'm reminded of the story that Will Rogers, the comedian uh, in the 19, 1940s, um, he called a press conference uh, in the beginning of the Second World War. And he said he had the solution to the uh, problem of the German submarines, the U-boats. Well, so a bunch of press came, well, Mr. Rogers, what's the problem? What's the solution? So well, here's, here's all we have to do. What we got to do is boil the ocean and then they'll all come to the top and then we can just shoot them. I said, but Mr. Rogers, how do we boil the ocean? He said, I gave you the answer, you work out the details. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna be in the position of saying just work out the details because it's a lot more. So I wanna mention three things. First is we have, to, I think we have to go back to basics. I think it's as primary as those five practices that I mentioned at the beginning, which are things all human beings can do. And how we build from that, it's putting people at the center so that the power is people centered and not what we're, dealing with. So first question, who are we to each other? Who are we to each other? What does it mean to be in a civic relationship with other people? What does it mean to be equal members of a polity? Now we have many identities, we have many distinctions. What is it to share a civic identity? What, what do we even mean by that? Uh, the relational work, there's, there's narrative work there to do, there's multiracial work there to do, to even come to terms of understanding that as a moral foundation. The second is about learning, relearning how to govern ourselves. You know, my students have no idea how to have a meeting. I, maybe that's just my students. It sounds trivial. But the reality is that when you get together with a small group of people and it turns into a disastrous experience, then what does collective action even mean? I mean, I, maybe this is only my students, but I think that small group work is often disastrous. And, you know, I say we're going to form teams. Oh, no, we want to do that. It's really ironic because it is the fundamental form of self-governance. And if we don't experience dem democracy in a micro immediate way, what are we even talking about when we're talking about the macro? Most of us spend our lives as Elizabeth Anderson, the philosopher at, at University of Michigan uh, uh, argues in what she ironically calls communist dictatorships. Entities governed from the top down in which we own nothing and in which we're told what to do. 
and it even goes into our private lives. Now that can be a nonprofit structure or it could be a for-profit structure. They're still firms. They are not associations. They're not organizations that build democracy. So, and, and I just want to say in that regard that, um, okay, last thing, I need the hope part, right? I get the hope, okay. Um, is we, the, the real challenge from my perspective is how to restore people-centric sources of collective power. Now, what does that mean? Traditionally, social movements have played a major role in doing that in our history. Uh, Dan Schlossman has a wonderful book about when movements anchor parties that shows the way in which social movements have influenced parties. And it's been this kind of dance from outside inside. Now, the question is, what is the social movement? We have lots of movements around, different kinds. They're all fragmented. They're about different issues. I'm for fish, he's for trees. Uh, how do we turn that kind of energy into the transformational energy so that we're able to mobilize enough power to trump the veto points so we could actually begin changing these institutions? Young people are a critical source of energy. It was in my generation, I believe it is in this one. Racial justice claims, gender justice claims, economic justice claims, uh, the critical challenge of the climate crisis. So my question is why People talk so much about polarization. The polarization all occurred on the right. The polarization was the radical polarization of the conservative movement in the Republican Party. If you look at the rest of like Democrats, didn't move that much. The problem there is not polarization, it's fragmentation. And the question of how to get at that one and what kind of narrative, what kind of strategy and what kind of structures it takes to do that, that's what I think the work is. Thanks. Thank you, Marshall. So I'm struggling with the complexities of a hybrid meeting. So we're going to do our best with the Q&A. We're going to start with the online questions. So the people in the audience, you guys can cogitate and come up with your questions and we'll go back and forth. The first is a general question for the panel. Oh, and Liz and Michelle, if you want to answer, just raise your hands and I'll, I'll we'll unmute you. That's the complexity I was trying to figure out. Uh, but the first question is, an audience member says, this has been so wonderful and thought provoking. Some colleagues and I have been talking about whether more and more community organizing outfits and models are becoming more transformative. In other words, transforming the self toward a person oriented centrally toward collective liberation rather than transactional. Are you seeing more shift recently, even though clearly as some of the speakers have noted, not enough? Anybody wanna take that on? I think, there's I think they're essentially asking, are we moving more toward the, the broader picture than just tactical, right? Or just kind of one off? I, there's elements of it, I think. I think the question is, how do elements of something become a dominant current or a dominant wave? I think there is, certainly there's lots of questions about, about self, about identity, about who are we with each other. Um, and that emotional underpinning, and I'm using emotional in the fullest, like, a, Values are emotional, and it requires emotional language to actually make values real and speak of them in a real way. And I think that, and the question of where's this moral foundation, you know, for what we're doing? Why, why does it really matter? I think people are struggling with that a lot. And I, I see it in different movements, and I think it's important that they're struggling with it. Um, how far are we getting with it? I, we, have a, we have a ways to go. I want to just, there was a little thing in the question that sort of bothered me. I mean, I, I agree that we're getting um, to, we're beginning to build organizations and movements that take real cognizance of values and of emotions, but we don't want to lose all of the transactional elements. I think it's really important to remember that people live in places, they have needs, there are transactions that they want served. And that that's part of what building a community organization and power of the people is based on is recognizing both their actual physical transactional, if you will, needs and their emotional and value needs. I think the, if, to come. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go. no, I was going to say, I think that the problem is when it all gets reduced to transaction. That's right. Which is what I the Demo which is what the Democrats do. And it's kind of like we're going to give you this goodie. So now vote for us. Or there nothing. Is, or nothing. But, <laughs> Which but, is more often. <laughs> well, but the theory, the promise then even isn't for, it's not about respect. It's not about uh, equality. Uh, it's, 
it's really ironic. I, I don't know how many people saw this. Uh, it's gone viral. Uh, the state senator from Michigan, uh, uh, Mallory, uh, was it Mallory McCammon? Anybody see that? It was an extraordinary four minute video of talking real talk to real people about real needs. We don't get that. We don't hear that. And so, yes, it has to be real in that sense, but it also has a values dimension to it that's been really missing from so much of the rhetoric. I think um, from the vantage point I see, sit at, uh, which is membership-based organizations, yeah. um, and especially at the intersection of elections, um, and you know, I think Marshall was referencing this. There is this entire industry um, that has popped up around elections specifically that can make it very difficult for a membership-based organization um, to try to build power over those candidates or eventual elected officials. And so as running an organization like Color of Change or Color of Change PAC, which is trying to elect people, but will also like call them out when they're not adhering to the things that we wanted them to do, um, for a certain set of funders, that is not um, work that is funded, um, which is fine. That means we have to find our own sort of uh, set of resources and things, but the result is is that there's an industry of these sort of pop up organizations. Liz um, also sort of represented them, uh, 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 talked about them a little bit, uh, who uh, spend a lot of money and show up very loudly for very brief periods of time for some people. Um, and then um, once those people are actually in office um, and don't deliver the things they promised, uh, it continues to destroy, I think, the credibility. Um, and, and so I think those are, uh, I, I know that there are a set of membership-based organizations that are trying to get out of this loop of, oh, we can only get funded to knock on people's doors mm -hmm. during an election versus like, we want to invest in training of our members or building community of our members. Um, but it can be difficult to do, do that and compete in elections where you want your organization's name to show up on a campaign finance report because when that person gets elected you want to be able to call them and say you know don't prosecute marijuana offenses um, as as the district attorney or whatever sort of um, um, office that you're challenging in isn't, isn't so much of it the dependency on funders to begin with mm -hmm. In other words, rather than earning power by building a powerful constituency, you earn power by writing a compelling proposal and then feeding that relationship and building that relationship. And so now we need to convince funders of this, funders mm -hmm. of that. You know, I don't want to back in the day, but, you know, <laughs> when we needed in the farm workers movement, when we needed funding, we needed for our strikes, we got it from unions, we got it from churches, we got it at least from places that had a values consistency and a similar political agenda mm -hmm. to our own, which is very different than some Silicon Valley millionaire who invented a widget that thinks they know everything about everything. And I, I just think that shifting that base back mm -hmm. in some way, we got to find out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Anyone in the room want to? Oh, sorry, Liz. I just wanted to make a quick comment about the transformation versus transaction point, because I think it's a critical one. Um, Margaret's research that shows you, you know, you have to get the goods for the movement. I just think it's, it's better, it's more useful, I think, to think about that in terms of power as opposed to transaction. In other words, are you, are you winning on Stephen Luke's first phase of power? Are you winning on the campaign, the material good? Are you winning on the second phase, changing the conditions and the rules of the game and who's in the room deciding that? And then on the third phase, are you changing the narratives about what people even believe is possible? And so um, I just think that the word transaction makes it sounds, you know, business-like and ephemeral in the ways that we've been talking about. But if we think about that in terms of actually exercising power and getting the goods for your base, um, that's something we found resonant in our cases as well. Thanks. We're Technology all rolling well. with it. Okay. Boy. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to um, ask about um, the, uh, the impact of technological change. And um, I want to ask about it. it. used to be you had a job as an organizer. You would meet with people. You would have to, like, you know, do some homework, do some reports, all that. But now you have to be on Slack all the time. Now you have to be part of a social media strategy. Now you have to be following social media and all of that. 
And so on the one hand, it seems that that's uh, creating a new set of problems for people doing real organizing or, or, or challenges or new demands on their time or whatever. But then secondly, um, when we talk about, um, you know, people doing organizing, there's um, uh, organizations and personal relationships are now intermediated by um, things like algorithms uh, uh, put out by companies that are actually like primed to uh, antagonize people and divide them into tri tribes and polarize them around different issues. And it strikes me that um, that uh, this is an impediment because um, I see it in my everyday life um, that uh, people in my life are polarized around issues in ways that are very kind of like powerful and you see like flashes of anger when like a position is taken on something or another that I don't think you would have seen 10 years ago. And I know that um, there's an entire industry of saying, oh, all these causal claims about what Silicon Valley is doing, you know, you can't nail the causation, but of course that's because they won't give us the data to do the research. Um, and I'm just wondering if any of you have any comments on uh, how this complicates or does not complicate some of the things you've been talking about. Well, I think the first thing to say is burnout has been a problem for community organizers for <laughs> as long as there have been community organizers. Probably since Moses. Actually. It was going to go <laughs> way back, right? Um, that'll do. <laughs> Maybe even before that. Yeah. The other is, of course, you know, the, co the compl complexities of our digital world and the kinds of uh, news and echo chambers and other things that are occurring are clearly making it difficult to create a kind of unity. There's no question about that. But I think it's also worth looking at the other side of that because there are lots of ways in which digital platforms, I was t talking about worrying about how do you scale what we found in looking at unions. There are also some really interesting cases. I'm not saying they're all the cases or, I mean, and they really have to be interrogated. But there are lots of cases where people are using digital tools to engage an organization and reaching people and talking to people and having relationships. Zoom is mediated, but it allows a conversation in a different way and with people you might not otherwise meet in a time zone you might not otherwise be able to interact with. So I've been part of a series of processes looking at ways that it's happening at that other university that you don't like to mention. Um, but there is a lab on digital democracy that is really thinking about ways in which these platforms can be used to create com different kinds of community organizations, as well as to facilitate democracy, not only think about the ways in which it undermines democracy. So I think when we look at these things, we've got to look just as with every technological change. I was just reading a book where the people hated the Gutenberg Bible, or they hated the introduction. Socrates hated the introduction of papyrus and people <laughs> writing. They shouldn't, that, you know, that destroyed their creativity and their capacity to interact with each other it was a mediated process. Um, you know, so I think these things always have a good and a bad. And, and if we're going to talk about change, we need to think about not just the things that are blocking it, but also the things that are enabling it. And I'd like to think more about how digital platforms can be used to help us. So we're going to switch to Michelle online. Okay, hopefully people can hear me. Um, so I just wanted to build off of what Margaret was saying about there being potential for, um, you know, online spaces to, uh, you know, have, have potential. Um, I've had several experiences with this. Um, so some of the findings in our research in PRISMS I actually think can be translated in certain ways into an online context. So I've been part of multiple online constituency bases, one of which is uh, the BTS Army, which is a K-pop fandom, and another of which is uh, our anti-work, which is a Reddit, uh, subreddit, um, where, uh, you know, I, I can make posts that will reach 50,000, you know, people to, I think my, you know, best one has reached like 3 million people, right? And so, and this is a community that meets regularly, that talks regularly about issues, possibly building class consciousness. I agree that a lot more research and kind of, you know, figuring out what's actually going on in these space, spaces needs to be done. But I do think there's potential, um, although the algorithm issue is one that I am very concerned about as well. 
it took only to the end for me to figure out how to make that happen. So unfortunately, we are at time. Oh you should gosh. feel free. I know it went oh, so fast crazy. and it we went so fast started. because <laughs> they are so brilliant. And it was an incredibly, I think, stimulating and wise and substantive conversation. So please join me in thanking all of our panelists for sharing their wisdom with us today. Thank you too. And, and I hope Liz and Michelle, you can hear that online. We so appreciate you guys uh, being willing to hang out in the virtual world with us. We look forward to reading the book. And of course, people should feel free to come up and you can ask your questions um, in real life. And all of you who joined us online, thank you so much. And be sure to look at the other uh, wonderful Matrix events coming up. We're having an event you, with John Powell tomorrow. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it's yeah just, just announce it. You oh, know. OK. All right. There's an event tomorrow <laughs> sponsored by, let's see, it's the Mario. The Othering and Belonging Institute. Othering and Belonging Institute. <laughs> yeah, a conversation about is polarization really the problem? Uh, and I'll be in a conversation with John Powell about that. Right. Seems interesting. So people are welcome to come. Listen. Great. Yeah. Thanks. And get more commercial. Thank you. Thank you.